Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 228, Danny Hurley. Uh, Tommy Danny, of course, just won his second straight national championship at UConn. Epic run, epic team. He has one of the most fascinating coaching backgrounds uh, because of his father, uh, Bob Hurley Sr., who was a legendary high school basketball coach at St. Anthony's. I referenced this during the interview real quick. Uh, Woj wrote a book uh, maybe 15, 17 years ago called The Miracle at St. Anthony. It is about Bob Hurley and his family and the school and all of the challenges that the school and the basketball team face. It is one of my favorite books of all time. I highly recommend it, and it is absolutely timeless. If you haven't read it, go read it. It's really one of the best basketball books ever written. It's so good. For, for at, at, at any level. And no, Woj Co- did not pay me to do this. Coaching. I just, I love this book. It's, it's actually how I met Woj. I, we talked after the book came out because I was like, dude, this is incredible. Well, it's funny. I mean, I don't want to you know, sidetrack it with this, but this, I feel like Woj wrote the book. You might know this better than me. I feel like he wrote the book before he became Woj. You know what I mean? Before he became sort of the newsbreaker guy. And it's so well written. It's and incredible. it also just, it also tells, uh, I mean, the story of the, the, sco- the story of that family is incredible, but the story of the school is also incredible. And basically what they sort of went through to create, you know, this dynasty in the yes. middle of Jersey City is, is really insane. Uh, Danny, of course, his older brother, uh, Bobby Hurley. Uh, Bobby is a, a college basketball legend, one of the greatest players at uh, Duke of all time. Uh, lottery pick in the NBA, uh, had, a, had a career in the NBA. He's also a coach. Uh, he's at Arizona State now. Danny, by the way, uh, has uh, you know been an assistant in college. He's been a high school basketball coach in New Jersey. He started his college head coaching career at Wagner. He was at Rhode Island. He's now been at UConn six years. And it is remarkable to talk to someone who is so thoughtful, so intense, and to get a feel for how you get from point A to point B. Just a remarkable story, a remarkable coach. Loved every second of this interview. I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Before we get to Danny, uh, Tommy, let's do our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. Uh, we've got the seven seeds decided as of today, so we know the two seven matchups. Uh, I, of course, called the Philly game last night. They, they beat the Heat in, uh, in what was not the prettiest of games, <laughs> no. but an, an, an intense game. It felt like a playoff game. Uh, I do want to focus, though, in the Western Conference, a rematch of last year's Western Conference Finals, and that is uh, the Lakers, who did not duck the smoke in what was uh, a horrible suggestion from a number of people uh, that they uh, tank the seven seed to avoid Denver. Like, what? I don't... It's so asinine, I'm not even going to... I don't even want to waste my breath on it. It's the... You got to save your words, as we were saying. (laughs) A little under the weather. All right. I've got back to back games Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to save my voice for this one. Okay. Let's focus on this Denver uh, Lakers matchup. Lakers have lost the last nine games against Denver. The last time they beat them was April 22. Broadly, macro, what has to to happen for them to uh, change that dynamic? You know, uh, there's a few things. So, I want to say one thing real quick because uh, Denver's heavy favorites in this series. Uh, they're at minus 310 to win this series. Lakers are at plus 250. And I feel like a lot of the chatter uh, has been that the Lakers can't beat Denver. They need to avoid Denver. Um, the uh, Denver is, you know, far and away the, the best team when it comes to the playoffs. Uh, all of that can be true. All of that can be true. But I want to acknowledge how good this Lakers team has been, particularly on the offensive side of the basketball, since they inserted Roy Hachimura into the starting lineup permanently, uh, starting with the February 3rd game uh, against the New York Knicks. Since they put him in the starting lineup, he's tw- they're 22-10. and 10. Uh, They have shot the shit out of the ball. Uh, number three, three-point percentage during that time frame. Number three, offense during that time frame. Number 22 defense. Uh, so 
here, here's the deal. And that I want to reference the defense. We saw this last year in the conference finals. We've seen a number of teams do this this year. You cross match with Jokic and you keep your rim protector off of Jokic. Um, Jokic has scored against everybody, right? So I, I would expect the Lakers to do quite a bit of that. Um, the thing with the Lakers, if you're trying to attack them, how can we get Anthony Davis away from the basket? And whether it's, you know, running high pick and rolls with whoever he's guarding, we could see some Jamal Murray pick and rolls with Aaron Gordon, let's say, if they're cross-matched that way. Um, so keeping Anthony Davis in the paint, that's number one priority. Uh, Denver wants to score in the paint. They've been top five in points in the paint pretty much the whole season. They're not a high-volume three-point shooting team. Uh, they're not a high pace team. They want to milk the clock, execute, and get baskets in the paint. That is what they do. Uh, keep Anthony Davis in the paint. That's number one. Number two, uh, you got to look for margins here. Where can we exploit the margins? If I'm the Los Angeles Lakers, I need to get LeBron James out in transition. I need transition buckets. Uh, the shooters, Austin Reeves, Torian Prince, Hachimura, uh, of course, D'Angelo Russell, who's had an incredible season. Uh, they have to shoot the ball well. Uh, again, Denver, good three-point shooting team, not a high-volume three-point shooting team. Can they win the three-point battle there? Fast break, can they win that there? And then, of course, with the Lakers, it's part of the discourse. This is a team that doesn't foul, and they are trying to get to the basket as well. They get fouled a lot. So if they can win the free-throw battle per, per usual, you know, those four factors right there, that's what I'm looking at in this series. You mentioned D'Angelo. Do you view him, I mean, this was this was the case in the playoffs last year as well, as a little bit of a, you know, X factor, a little bit of a test in terms of how he goes, the team goes? I do. I do for sure. Um, you know, the, I think depending on, uh, you know, different matchups in the playoffs, I, I you know, I, I would expect uh, Austin Reeves to take a lot of the Jamal Murray assignment. Uh, he's a little bit bigger. Uh, that's what they've done a lot this year uh, against guys like Jamal Murray. With the starting group, they put Austin Reeves on him. So the question becomes, how does Denver sort of uh, target hunt with D'Angelo Russell? Can he battle defensively and stay on the floor? Because his offense, his playmaking, his ability to run, pick, and roll, let LeBron rest, his ability to spot up, and shoot catch and shoot threes, shoot off the dribble, all that stuff. It's so important for the Lakers. So he's absolutely the X factor. The question is, when it, when it's crunch time and it comes down to, can we guard the Jamal Murray, uh, Nikola Jokic two-man game, uh, end of game, can D'Angelo Russell stay on the floor? I was going to ask about, you know, broadly in the playoffs, it's sort of the the... The under the the key on Ellis's, if you will, the guys who are going to have an impact that you know we saw it last night with Batum, but like the guys that are going to have an impact that we're not necessarily talking about right now. One guy I wanted to bring up in this series was Gabe yeah. Vincent, who did a good job on Murray in the finals last year. Do you feel like if if the if the Lakers are really going to have a chance, where some of this advantage might just be is this depth? I mean, we talked about then Den, Den, we talked about that being a worrisome area for Denver going into the season, losing Brown. And just like having some, having a little, and I think they've, they've answered that a bit, Yeah. but just the fact that the Lakers can throw out guys like Gabe, even throw out guys like Dinwiddie, you know, and they don't need too much from them. But if you're in the, if you're spotting your starters in these minutes with, you know, veterans who've been there before, who've played in the finals before. Um, I don't, I personally don't worry too much or get caught up in the depth factor per se, because Playoff rotations are so different. Now, great example of that is the Denver Nuggets last year, who played um, different guys as the backup five all season. Um, you know, and, and they lost all those minutes. And then they get to the playoffs, which we saw the other night, and they've done it a couple times this season, not a ton. Uh, I think it's been like around seven to ten games. They've used Aaron Gordon as the backup five. They're going to use Aaron Gordon as the backup five, right? So I think with the Lakers, as it relates to the Lakers, it's how are we managing the non-LeBron minutes? How are we managing the non-Anthony Davis minutes? Obviously, I, I would expect Darvin Ham to stagger those guys uh, when they do get their rests. So it's not so much about depth. It's about essentially staying even when you don't have your core five on the floor. Gabe Vincent, certainly an X factor because of his ability at times to get hot, hasn't had a healthy season, hasn't had a consistent season. I get all that. But we saw him in big moments last year in the playoffs uh, step up 
and make shots. You know, we saw this last night with Batum. It's like, can a guy come in in a quarter and make three or four threes? Yeah. That changes the dynamic of a game. Yep. Philly was like the also energy just, in that building. You were there. Vet, just vets. Yeah. It was like vets. the Mike even, Breen even, free chicken call. Uh, and the crowd gets going, and then Batum hits a three on the next possession. All of a sudden, it's a different game. Yeah. I mean, Buddy buddy as well, campaign, even hit a, hit a big corner. It's just these guys who've been there before. Yeah. You know, the the, the thing, well, Buddy's not been there because that was a well, that's actually, that's hey, Technically, <laughs> technically, <laughs> Buddy has not he been still there. still has that not played wrong. a playoff game because yesterday doesn't count for anything. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I I did the whole DraftKings Islands in the League episode uh, around this time last year about Alfred's. Uh, and their importance, particularly in the playoffs, um, an Alfred can swing a basketball game. You need your stars to play well. You're not going to win a series unless your stars play well. That is a fact. But game to game, if you can have an Alfred step up and and make big shots like Gabe Vincent, uh, that certainly can swing a game and potentially swing a series. This has been our DraftKings Sportsbook segment the NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JJ. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Tommy, let's get to our conversation with UConn men's basketball head coach, two-time national champion, Danny Lee. Coach, first off, congratulations. Thanks for joining us. I know you're getting inundated with a ton of media requests. Uh, you know, I had, I had posed to a, a few people on our team leading into the final four weekend. I'm like, regardless of what happens, <laughs> we need to get Danny Hurley on like this has to happen. So I'm glad this worked out. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Uh, thanks man. Big fan. People can't get enough of me. Uh, they don't know what to, they don't know what to make of me. <laughs> I actually want to start with a quote I came across recently. Uh, there was all this um, back and forth on on Twitter with Cal leaving, waiting to announce, taking the Arkansas job. And there's a college reporter named Keith Taylor, mm. who I guess had interviewed Bobby Bowden years ago. And he's got this quote from Bowden that he, Bobby Bowden says, who, who obviously won multiple national championships. He said, I've been up on that mountaintop and there ain't nothing there. <laughs> I'm curious now that you've been up on the mountaintop twice, was there anything there? And if there was, what did you find? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there was nothing there. Um, there was nothing there with that one. You know, obviously your, your agent, um, you know, your, 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 your agent is talking to you. Um, you know, as, as soon as Cal went, um, you know, cause it's, uh, we're having an incredible season, you know, after what we did last year and, you know, he's obviously trying to negotiate extensions and he's trying to get more money for the staff. And, you know, you're trying to make sure that your NIL collective is where it needs to be. Um, and we want to make sure that they redo the, the boys locker room, uh, and that the housing for next year is better, <laughs> you know, for the players that we can move into the nicer apartments and stuff. So, um, you know, your, your agent has to kind of keep, you know, keep leverage. Uh, so he asked you to be as evasive as you can when you answer questions about any other schools interested in you as a coach, even though in your mind, you know, that there's like zero chance that you're leaving UConn uh, to coach anywhere else uh, in your college career. So I ended up sounding like an idiot. I dragged my wife into it. Hey, you guys asked my wife. 
Um, you know, she makes all the decisions. She does not make all the decisions. She makes uh, a majority of them, 90%, but not all of them. You know, what's interesting is I, I apologize if I wasn't clear in the question, but I do appreciate you giving me the reason why you didn't go to Kentucky. I'm sorry that I had to bring Kentucky into this. I meant more of the Bobby Bowden quote, which was talking about winning a championship. Aaron Rodgers, actually, when he won with Green Bay, he talked about this too. He talked about winning a championship and he thought he was going to feel a certain way. He thought it was going to f- have a sense of self-validation and all this stuff. I, I, I want a national championship in AAU and a state championship in high school. I never won a college championship, never won an NBA championship. And the quote from Bowden, you know, about getting to the mountaintop and not finding anything. Yeah, yeah I got you. And, and I, I'm just curious for someone who has literally lived in basketball their whole life, and I would assume has found an incredible level of meaning and identity with this game and with this sport Mm -hmm. and the relationships you build. When you do get to the mountaintop, and you've been there twice now, and you've, you've won these championships, did you find anything? Was there something on the mountain? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, man, on that one. Uh, just for me, I think it's different just because of, of uh, you know, you, your dad's a Hall of Famer. Um, you know, one of just a couple of high school coaches and, and one of the best coaches of his generation. Uh, and then you got Bob, who is, uh, you know, maybe the greatest point guard to ever play in college. Uh, you know, lottery pick, two national championships at Duke. You know, so for a, a lot of my life in basketball, um, you know, I, I had done some like really good to, to great things as a player and as a coach, um, you know, but, but I hadn't had that like, you know, career defining elite, you know, championship moment, uh, you know, and, and I, so I've always been the third Hurley uh, and, and a distant third. So, so for me in a way, um, you know, I, there's a, I've been a lot lighter since we won it, since we won it the first time. Um, but then, yeah, that there's uh, that euphoria doesn't last very long, um, you know, whatsoever. I mean, there's a high, no doubt, that lasts a couple of days, and then you you may feel it, you know, intermittently if when you head to the White House, um, or you go and do some type of parade or what have you. But you know, what what you do discover at the top of the mountain was that uh, you the you were about the work that you you loved, <laughs> you love the work, man. The work is. Uh, is the reward. Um, and then, uh, the one thing I'll say though, when, when you, you feel differently about the, the, the players on that team and the team itself, when you do like win something like that or get to a final four, um, uh, where like, there's a feeling of love and adulation that you have for your staff, your players, and how you'll always think about them the rest of your life that you'll never forget what that, like that, how you feel about that, that team. So you, you hated your Wagner players is what you're saying. I hate them. <laughs> no, I hate them. No. <laughs> that's why we that's why um you know we flirted with the 20 hour work week because you know we 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 had to learn how to put the ball in the bucket. <laughs> no, I I'm, I'm only kidding with you. It is funny though. You know, I've I've you know played on a number of teams and had I've had some great coaches, man. And uh the special groups, I think I think you remember and cherish the relationships on those groups, you just do you, when you're in on a tumultuous uh, <laughs> team, maybe you're losing, maybe the locker room is not right. It's harder to like, you know, down the line, look back and be like, man, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I really enjoyed that coach. I, the, 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 the thing you just said I, I about euphoria, you know, I couldn't agree more in just in terms of any accomplishment, throughout life, when you are someone that falls in love with the process and the work more than the result, uh, I think that's true. The part that you said about feeling lighter after the first one in reference to, uh, as in your words, by the way, uh, being the, being the third Hurley, um, what does that lightness look like? What does that feel like? How does that manifest at home? How does that manifest with your group, your coaching? What do you mean by that? The, 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 the feeling lighter. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's something, you know, you, you, you said it, man, basketball has been, you know, basketball and family and, and faith, like the three, uh, you know, cornerstones of your life. And, um, you know, my whole life, I've either been playing it or coaching it. You know, you, you're always, you know, the, the brother of and the son of, um, you know, and, and that, that, that gets tough after a while, especially if you're experiencing that from like, when you're like, like a little kid up until you're 50 years old, <laughs> you know, it's like every time you're introduced, um, every article that's written about you, um, because they don't, because they can't reference a final four or a national championship, that opening article, um, it would, you know, it was always, you know, you know, Dan Hurley, the coach at UConn, who's the fuck now when articles are written, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, whether that's right or wrong, you know, your, 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 your confidence level, um, you know, as, as a leader, uh, you know, how you walk into a restaurant, um, <laughs> you know, how you show up for an awards dinner and, and, you know, I, I think that there's definitely been, um, you know, just an overall change in just, uh, you know, your confidence, your swagger, um, because, uh, you know, what we've been able to do the last two years, uh, you know, put you at, at the top of your profession. And when you're at the top of your profession, you know, you, you, you certainly feel way more confident and um, it, it changes you, no doubt. I want to talk about your offensive system. <laughs> and the evolution from your time as a high school coach, uh, head coach at, at Wagner at Rhode Island, early at UConn. What are the influence? You guys run fucking good shit, man. I yeah. I've been saying this uh, all season long. You, this this I'll be honest with you. This is the most I've watched college basketball in about ten years. <laughs> and I no I because I just I'm so plugged in. Like I'm just obsessed with the NBA. Yeah, but yeah. I actually found myself watching Big East games. I watch Big Ten games. Of course, I watch some Duke games, and and I, I watch conference tournaments this year. The the most most if not all of the NCAA tournament uh, I caught, and I was always impressed with how you guys ran offense. Yeah. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of multiple option, multiple read, misdirection stuff, and I have griped that there's some college coaches that haven't evolved and built in modern concepts to their offenses. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, the evolution of it, but also the influences on it. The 82 game preseason is in the books and it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boost, and so much more. Tons of intriguing matchups in both conferences. That 3-6 spot in the West between Minnesota and Phoenix is going to be fascinating. As of right now, Minnesota is favored in that series. But, of course, we'll see what happens after game one. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JJ. New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code JJ only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. OM3 fans, do any of these resonate with you? Your nutrition could use a boost. You stress eat or skip meals. Your sleep routine could benefit from improvement. You find yourself scrolling longer than intended every night. Managing a household and a career can be stressful. It takes a toll on your energy levels. These factors can affect various aspects of our lives, including the health of our hair. Your hair is never just about your hair, and Nutrafol knows that. It could be your job, your deodorant, your hormones, or even what you eat. 
It could be almost anything that has almost nothing to do with hair. That's why Nutrafol takes a whole body approach to hair health, addressing the problems inside to help hair grow on the outside, supporting your lifestyle, not just your hairstyle. Address your root causes of hair thinning with Nutrafol. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month's subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code JJ. Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code JJ, that's Nutrafol.com, promo code JJ. Yeah, um, so a lot, like obviously a lot of trial and error, uh, JJ, I think. A lot of it just goes back to being a high school coach for, for those nine years. Um, and, and, you know, trying to find your identity, uh, you know, experimenting, obviously those weren't just like, kind of like regular, you know, high school teams, you know, J.R. Smith was one of the, you know, the first great players I, I coached in high school. Um, and obviously his shot selection would get away from me at times. Um, <laughs> even back then. <laughs> yeah, even back then, my, I remember my dad coming to like my high school games, man, and like, uh, you know, leaving at the end of the third quarter and just kind of shaking his head at me at what I was allowing Jr. <laughs> you know, Jr. to do on the court. Um, so you know, like it, from Jr. to Tristan Thompson, just uh, Lance Thomas who played at Duke. Um, yeah, just having coached really high level players at the high school level. Um, you know, at a young age, uh, you know, I kind of grew up quick. I was allowed to, you know, kind of fail without a lot of pressure. Um, if I was a, a mid major or a high major head coach first time, shit, I would have drowned it, man. in that, so, uh, you know, got a chance to really develop as a coach at the high school level. Um, and just, you know, having watched my dad just, uh, always studying the game, man, always, uh, you know, always like back then it was taping games and, watching the best college offenses, watching, you know, NBA quick hitters, uh, you know, watching, you know, national teams and, and, and a lot of Euro ball just to try to find concepts. Um, you know, so coaching at St. Benedict's, coaching at Wagner, coaching at Rhode Island, um, like high school, low major, mid major. It's not like I didn't ever work for, um, like a, a coach where I was married to a system having been coaching in like high school, low major, you're always like getting the most talented players that you can find and then adapting whatever system that you're going to come up with uh, to, to fit the personnel. I think there's a lot of college coaches that like work for somebody that ran a certain system and they could just coach that coach that one system. Whereas like uh, I got the ability to adapt with that, that high school background. That's one of the markers of a, a great coach to me. Uh, adaptability. Um, I think, you know, having played for coach, I, that was always something that stuck out to me as a Duke fan, a Duke player, and then post graduate <laughs> watching him evolve and adapt with yeah. the players that he had on his team. There's a specific play. Uh, and again, college rules are different than the NBA rules, but in some ways they mirror FIBA a little bit with the defense of three seconds. And a lot of times uh, when you have a big guy that can't shoot or in college, not so much in the NBA anymore, but there might be a second guy on the floor that's a non-shooter. Uh, their defender will just sit in the paint. There's a play you guys have where you run a skip pass uh, to the big, and then you get into a series of high splits. Sometimes it, it's a ghost screen for a, you know, a dunk, or you get to a three pointer either on a DHO or a catch and shoot. Where did the fuck did you steal that play from? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, so I, I think the inspiration the last two years, especially this year, is like watching college football now or, or Shanahan from the NFL, how they'll have like um, like the, the, the these four, obviously the pace and the tempo of, yeah. of, of, the, of their cuts and, and their actions, but like how they'll have like uh, trips out of shotgun, um, you know, with two in the backfield and out of that formation, there's like seven or eight different things they do out of it. Right. There's like a, a sweep, a play action, you know, uh, a deep post, right. All these different things. So I think going into this year, you know, me and me and Luke Murray, we, we got together and we're like, you know, we, we want to have like 
you know, 10 different formations, all right? Whether it's, you know, a floppy, uh, you know, a, a, a regular horns with the four and five high and inverted horns, a low one four, um, you know, a box set. We want to have like eight to 10 different, uh, you know, different formations that we would have, uh, you know, all these different wrinkles for, right? Uh, you know, something for a shooter, whether it's like a, you know, wide pin or a flare rescreen or, you know, a jet, uh, you know, jets for us, which, which are staggers. Um, so at a very formation, we want to have something for a shooter, something that's going to finish with some type of a ball screen, a ball screen action, something with a deep post up, something to open up a, an ISO for somebody to drive it. Um, you know, like we want to have, so out of each formation, anytime we run it, the defense is going to have no idea whether it's a post up, something for a shooter or whatever it is. So that action you're talking about, that's, um, we saw somebody in FIBA do it. Maybe it was a team in Turkey. Um, and we just layered on top of what theirs was. Theirs was just basically, uh, a ghost at, like that ghost action from guard to guard where they were just trying to drive it. And the five man is in that opposite weak side corner. And now if his man steps up to help, they would just throw the lob dunk. And that was the whole action. So for us, we just wanted to kind of, if that was taken away, how are we going to continue to flow and play? So if we couldn't get downhill and drive it and the big sees that he's not going to get a lob dunk, he's now get, you know, he's now stepping, you know, catching that over the top pass, that guard, that ghost. He's using the flare into what would be a grenade or a dribble handoff. Uh, if they blow that up, now that weak side corner guard is now going to come back to a zoom on ball. And if it's a switching team, look for your slips. Um, you know, if they if they lock and chase everything, you could curl the four man. That's the one that you saw Alex Caravan slip, slip and dunk it. But it's just it's actions that's just layered on top of each other, and we just try to disguise it with with the formations. The I think that's the best description, uh, and, and it's it, it, and I mean this in, in watching it, in watching you guys. I'm always like, man, there's layers to it. There's yeah. layers to it. Uh, my, I've complained about this, but oftentimes I see teams with a lot of different movement and a lot of different actions, but it's all fluff. It's and I think there's tough. a, di it's it's there's a difference when you're, uh, you know, if, if you, let's say you're running out of a UCLA set and you're running a UCLA set and that first cut, that can't just be fluff. You've got to actually give that a look. You've got to actually set the screen because that sets up whatever the second, third misdirection action is. And anyways, it, it drives it's me crazy. A language, JJ, we make them, it's uh they take vocabulary tests. We have our own vernacular, right? So you know, you've got to understand like the offensive verbiage. It's a little bit like going into a huddle with the quarterback in a sense. So it's like floppy four, zoom jet, pitch slip, you, you know? So like, but with each action, yes, we're, we're playing like full speed. We're trying to exploit whether they've guarded it poorly and then we'll, we'll take the first one. Uh, but they learn to understand our language so well that with great pace and aggression, we, we could get to, you know, some of it's just some of it's motion, you know, some of it is flow play, but, but a lot of what you see is these guys just, they, they, they understand the different things that are layered on top of each other and they know it and they can think it the dumb jock thing. I'll show you our playlist from the year, man. It's like <laughs> dumb jock thing is, is a bunch of shit, a bunch of bullshit. These guys are smart. I, I certainly believe you in watching you play that you have uh, the highly intelligent basketball players. The reason I, by the way, that I pointed that play out um, and why I like it so much is because spacing, uh, is such a premium in our game today. And because of, uh, the NBA rules with defensive three seconds, and because most teams put at least four shooters on the floor. And a lot of times the non-shooter is the big, right. Mm -hmm. And he's typically a rim threat, a roller, whatever. Um, you don't run into a ton of scenarios where there's a non-shooter spaced and the defense is ignoring them. Certainly early in my career, there were times when that would happen. I remember being in playoff series where we're like, you're the help guy. Don't even worry about your guy. If he gets a back cut or if he gets a lob dunk, don't even worry about it. You're the help guy. Um, using those non-shooters 
in space as screeners, DHO guys. Yeah. Uh, that to me is like what it, what cracks the spacing cheat code. That's right. And that's why I love that play so much. Yeah. And I'm shocked that more teams don't <laughs> take advantage of the non shooters spaced as screeners. I fucking don't put them in the dunker spot. <laughs> don't put them in the dunker spot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we dealt with it last year, JJ. We were, I mean, we were shitting a bed in January last year. Andre Jackson is with the Bucks now. Um, you know, sh- shooting is not his strength. And, you know, we, d- I dumped him in the dunker. Um, we were fine in November and December, but once we got into league play, the people that know you the best, um, you know, they, they, you know, their, their guy was standing uh, under the rim with Andre. And, uh, you yeah, know, and when we just played him behind the three point line at the top of the key, um, you know, it just, uh, it, it didn't work. So, yeah, I mean, like those DHO, you know, grenades and using him as a ball screener, I think watching Bruce Brown, um, you know, in the, in that, uh, you know, in the playoffs earlier in his career, this was pre nuggets. Um, might've been with Brooklyn, you know, the way they were using him, even though he was six, two as a ball screener, uh, we use Steph castle this way. Um, and then, you know, we felt like a lot, a lot of times, putting them in the corner opposite, opposite the ball screen and the two side, and then having to make that, you know, if his man wanted to stand under the rim in the ball screen game, we just started throwing lob dunks to the corner of the backboard. Uh, so using those guys as cutters while, while that action's right. into the rim too. Right. Um, again, there's, there's the, the X and O's and the, the offensive and defensive concepts that go into coaching. Um, there's also the philosophy around coaching, uh, how you're going to speak to your group, uh, what accountability means to you, what building a culture means to you. What were obviously your dad, but what were some of the coaching influences for you? Uh, you know, specifically your dad, but, but anyone else that really had left an imprint and an impact on you for how you now coach 19, 20, 21 year old kids. Yeah. So, you know, it, it obviously, it, it stop it starts with, you know, with Bob senior. Um, and just, uh, I'd say from a defensive standpoint, I'm probably doing, you know, the same exact principles that he was teaching me and Bob in the, in the nineties. Right. So, um, you know, from a defensive standpoint, uh, you know, my, my dad, I'm I played for PJ Carlissimo, um, you know, who was a, you know, who was, a, who was one of the best coaches in, in, in big East history and his ability to build a, a tough team and a, and a, and a, and a team that really, really rebounds the ball. I learned some like outlier things from him, uh, that I use in college that sound, uh, that sound crazy. Like, um, like we don't do floor balance when shots go up, you know, we send five, all five guys to the offensive glass. It's almost like like football in a way, right? Like it's almost worth it to go for it on fourth down. Ball possession so important. Why not try to go get it, right? Um, and then the way we assault the offensive glass, you know, we've been, I think this year we were fifth. Um, we were 10th in the country in offensive rebound. We were fifth in defensive transition. Last year we were number one in offensive rebounding in the country and we were second in the country in defensive transition efficiency. So like crazy shit like that for with PJ, where he just sent sent everyone to the glass. Um, you know, it's something that that we do, and and it's had a, uh, you know, it, it batters our opponents. It like basically assaults them, uh, where they don't even want to run on us. Um, and then the people that I got to know over the years, Coach K, obviously with uh, you know having been so close to Bobby and um, just having watched uh, you know his his leadership. Um, he was also much different back then. He was much more, uh, he was on Bob's ass. I mean, he was on Bob's ass. He wasn't like the coach K that we saw towards the end who, you know, was way more buttoned up. Um, but, uh, you know, coach K Billy Donovan's always been a coaching idol for me, coach Izzo. Um, you know, I, I obviously, um, coach Blaney, uh, so I'd be long gone in basketball, man. I don't know if selling the insurance or what have you. Um, just coming in as PJ was going to the NBA and having a Jersey City connection. You know, he was he's from Jersey City. 
He played at Holy Cross. He was a like a legendary basketball player in, in Hudson County, the part of Jersey that I grew up in. And, um, you know, he gets that Seton Hall job, um, you know, just by chance where I'm at this like, you know, breaking point as, as, a, as a player and as a, as, a, as a young person in college where like I am adrift at sea, um, struggling in every facet of my life. And, and coach gets named, uh, you know, head coach. And, and back then, you know, JJ, the, the coaches weren't taking a holistic approach <laughs> to the development of their players, man. You saw your coach from three to six, y y you know, like, and, uh, and, and when practice was over, uh, you, you saw him the next day from three to six. And um, if you failed off the team, they cared about how you were doing in school. Right. So, but coach Blaney, man, he gets this job. And, um, and, and, um, he comes and picks me up in his dorm room and he brings me into his office and starts talking to me about life. <laughs> he starts talking to me about my faith. He starts talking to me about, you know, my relationships, my friendships, my relationships with women. Um, you know, he he starts talking to me about how, how things are going with my, with my therapist, my counselor, my psychologist on cam on campus, sister Catherine Waters. And you know, he kind of, um, you know, he loves me, you know, like he, he truly cares about every aspect of my life in a holistic way and kind of teaches me this incredible, I mean, number one, he turns me into, uh, the type of person that eventually, you know, would meet my wife and, and would, uh, kind of like he, he, th those rough edges, he kind of like, uh, ironed them out enough that, uh, that when I did meet my wife, like 18 months later, uh, you know, I, I was appealing enough to her that, that, <laughs> that she would change my life that way as well. But like, you know, coach Blaney, man, like, uh, taught me that like you could love your players and care about your players, uh, in, in every way that really matters. And, uh, I owe him everything because I'd be long gone, long gone for basketball. You can love your players and care about their lives, but still coach them. Coach and the and hold, hold them accountable. Like this, that, that to me was one of coach K's greatest gifts That's right. is like he, I also struggled in college. My first two years hit a really low point after my sophomore year would not be who I am today. Would not have had the career. I mean, there were thoughts of quitting and it was because he simply fucking cared. He cared enough to take the time to meet with me multiple times, to talk to me, to figure out what I needed to get my life back in order. And I'll never, for, I'll never forget it. Like it was the, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, and it's amazing what a coach can do, not just for, uh, oh, I've, I figured out how to make pick and roll reads, right. But yeah. for our growth as human beings. Yeah. The impact of a, of a, of a great teacher or, or a great coach or, you know, an uncle or a mentor, right. Like, uh, like it's, it, it's everything. And, uh, I've had so many of them. It's incredible and all types, but he came out of that era. I thought they were all cavemen coaches. He, he, he was, uh, he was a different type of different, different type of coach, different type of man. I always tell people this. I got a very different version of coach K <laughs> than the guys at the end of his career. Yes. Yes. I, 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 I feel like, the best way to describe it is that I was tested every day. And I don't mean by a quiz. <laughs> I meant my mental fortitude, my manhood, my pride, my mental toughness, like all of these things, whether it was a practice, a film session, team meetings, certainly the games, it was constant. I, uh, I, years ago when it came out, I read Woj's book on the miracle at St. Anthony. Um, and I always pictured Bob Sr. as this really maniacal guy. And I always equated him to coach. And there's one person in my life that I call coach, and that's Coach K. Uh, was your dad as maniacal as not only the book, but just the legend of him as, as, it, as it has been portrayed? Oh, yeah. Um... However, it's been portrayed. It's at least that. <laughs> at least that. <laughs> and, and you know, it, it's like 
you know, these guys too to the public. I mean, they see Coach K and obviously you know, he presents a certain way, Jay Wright, these guys, but they're as big a, you know, they're, they're as big a maniacal characters on the practice court in terms of accountability and intensity and attention to detail and get this shit right uh, and championship standards. Um, but the, I mean, the difference maker with, with, with my dad was, I mean, we went home with him. You know, like we went home with him and, and it just like his level of, of, of perfectionist or perfectionism, like relative to just like every aspect of everything we were doing, everything that we put the Hurley name on it, you know, like you got a 70 on a quiz, you know, back then uh, you used to have to get your quizzes and your tests signed by your, by your parents, especially if you did bad. Right. So shit, I would be so scared um, that I would forge it, you know, try to forge my old man's name. Cause I'd be like, there's no way I'm showing my dad a 71 on a math test. I mean, that, that's what the, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's what the, the standard was. Um, I mean, he, uh, I mean, it, it was brutal at times. Um, just, uh, you'd see your friends going, like we'd be dribbling to the park, you know, with my mom, she'd have like the, the two hour practice plan that we were going to do, you know, the first 15 minutes with the jump rope and she's got the stopwatch and the whistle. And me and Bob are dribbling the ball down the street to the country village courts to go do a workout in August for two hours in, in a hundred degree heat. As we're walking by kids that are going in their above ground pool, splashing around, you know, uh, <laughs> just, just shit like that. And then, um, you know, my dad, when he lost the game, he carried like for him, losing a game was so personal, like basketball, I, wrapped into your, our identity as a family and, and, and him as a coach and a man, there was like a shame that he felt when, when his team lost or, or, or failed. Like we watched him model for us. Like he wouldn't go to work for two days. Like he couldn't face people if St. Anthony lost. Um, they didn't lose much. I mean, <laughs> that's why maybe he didn't go to do college. <laughs> He knew, he knew, he, he knew he couldn't handle it um, maybe that way. But. Hey, fans of The Old Man of the Three, listen up. Have you heard you can listen to episodes of this very show ad-free on Amazon Music, included with your Prime membership? That's right. All your favorite Old Man and the Three episodes can be heard on Amazon Music ad-free. But that's not all. You can listen to other top podcasts like Morbid, Smartless, and The Low Post ad-free as well. They also have fan favorites like The Daily, Pardon My Take, and Up First, all without ads. You know what this means? Uninterrupted listening, so no more cliffhangers. Thank goodness. Amazon Music offers the most ad-free top podcasts, so I know they definitely have something for you. And it's already included with your Prime membership. To start listening, go to amazon.com slash jjpodcast. That's amazon.com slash jjpodcast or download the Amazon Music app for free. It's just that easy. A big thank you to our sponsor, SoFi, the official bank of the NBA. You're going to see SoFi a lot this month as we gear up for the SoFi play-in tournament. SoFi is helping fans get their money right with no account fees, one of the best APYs in the league, and up to a two-day early paycheck. When you sign up for SoFi Checking and Savings, you can score up to a $300 welcome bonus when you sign up with direct deposit. Visit SoFi.com backslash banking for full details. Plus, you'll automatically be entered into the SoFi Zero Giveaway where SoFi is dropping zeros into SoFi members' bank accounts throughout the playoffs with a new $10,000 winner every week. Yes, you heard me right, $10,000 winner every week. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary to enter when open only to legal U.S. residents 18 and over. Visit SoFi.com backslash zero for official rules. Ends 6 24 Thank you, SoFi. I like through lines in life. I like through lines in life. And is there, are there things from your dad, from, from being at St. Benedict's, coaching in high school that carry over that transfer well as a coach from high school to college. Yeah. I think, um, 
I think you're, you know, the, the number one part of your job. And obviously, you know, if you don't deliver the winning and, and producing highly successful professional players, it's not going to work, but um, you know, your, your job at its core is, is to help raise kids. Obviously now with the portal and um, you know, the extra COVID year, you're getting some older kids. Um, you know, but this is not the national basketball association. I mean, these are, this is kind of like the, the, we're the last group of people that's going to kind of help mold these guys and prepare them for, you know, what, what the professional world's going to look like and how competitive and intense like an NBA locker room is and what, what that looks like and, uh, and marriage and raising kids and, and then, you know, professional life beyond basketball. I'll, I'll never forget my, my headmaster at, at St. Benedict's. So I was year one. I got off to a shit start. Uh, I think we were three and four out of the gates. Uh, I wasn't uh, the rising star. I thought I was going to be, um, in early December. And he pulled me into his office and said, listen, you're, you're eventually going to, you got the pedigree, my man, you're eventually going to win a lot of games here. Just remember your number one job is to help me raise kids here. And uh, that, that had a huge impact on me, Father Edwin Leahy uh, at St. Benedict's. Another through line would be, that's an incredible story, by the way, and such a great foundation, by the way, it's such a great foundation. I, I, you, I, anything I do in my life, I'm constantly asking myself, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. Right. Why am I doing this? I can't, I can't always just get attached to a result. I can't always get attached to a salary. It's like, why am I doing this at its core? Why am I doing this? That's right. And that's an important thing to remember. The other through line I was going to bring up was just intangibles mm-hmm. because, you know, I, I think about if you're a GM, uh, if you're an NBA coach and you're going through the evaluation process uh, for, uh, you know, a, a, whether it's a FIBA player or a G League player or a college kid and you're going through the draft, you're obviously evaluating talent and skill. But there is clearly so much more that goes into being a great basketball player. What are the intangibles that you're looking for from high school players, or even now with the transfer porter, portal, what what are the things you are looking for beyond just can this guy dribble and shoot and defend, and he's six nine? Like w- there's there's something more to this game than just those things. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're looking for all the winning shit, man. It's like uh, you know we don't you know in recruiting bringing in the 19th ranked player in the country that comes into your program and organization and is like delusional, selfish. He's got crazy parents. He's got, you know, uh, grassroots coaches that just are, are ticking off the days until, um, you know, he enters the draft and hire, you know, like um, just trying to avoid, um, you know, bringing people like that in, into the organization. So I, I study the hell out of the people um, I watch when I'm at the AAU games, like I'm not playing with my phone. I, I like, I'm watching the kid, um, you know, obviously you're looking for the traits that, that you could build on, but you're looking to see, you know, do his teammates like him? Like when, when he makes a bucket and he goes to the ground, is anyone coming to pick him up <laughs> or, or are they just leaving his ass over there because he's brutal to play with, you know, when they sub him out, like, is he dapping everybody up down, you know, down through the bench or is he stop at the front of the bench, shake his head, not make eye contact with his coach, you know, or, or his parents bugging out in the crowd, you know, yelling at the coach. They can yell at the ref if they want, because I'm going to be, because I'm all in on that like myself, <laughs> but, you know, but like, are they, um, are they the type of people, you know, that could infect the organization, um, you know, with, with what Coach Riley, you know, had said, you know, a long time ago, that disease of me. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking, I'm brutally honest during the recruiting process too, JJ. So, like, when they're up here on campus um, and, and we're doing the X and O piece and how do you fit into our system, you know, we, we, you know, we talk through, um, you know, we talk through the areas where they're not very good and where they need to get better uh, significantly to help us win. And for us to help them get to, you know, we, we talk about it in equal measures, right? Our ability to, to help you get to where you want to get to, but it's not going to be at the expense of, of UConn pursuing championships. And, and I think that, you know, 
we, we've been just brutal honesty. I, I think, you know, me, I'm the same person every day, JJ. I don't, there's not another version of me, but for better or for worse, like what people see on game night is the same energy I bring to a summer workout. Um, these guys don't have to play for me for 12 years. Most of them, <laughs> most of them, it's a year, two years. We treat it like it's a sprint, but brutal honesty, um, always being the same guy every day and never putting one of those interests over the other, I think earns the trust and respect of the group. It is, I don't want to belittle any uh, coach or player that has been instrumental in building sustained excellence and culture in sport. I don't want to belittle that. Mm. But in some ways, is it as simple as I need to bring in the right type of people? Like, can you have the wrong guy in a good culture become then the right guy? Because I, I, I think there's probably a little bit of trade-off here yeah. when we're talking about building a culture in an organization or on a team. You need the people to do it. You need the right people to do it. It can't just be one guy. It can't just be you saying all the right things, doing all the right things. You got to have the right people within the organization, within the team, doing those things. And then what happens when you bring the wrong person in? Yeah. yeah. Um, listen, I think the, the culture here, um, you know, once we're able to kind of um, you know, get here and build some things and bring in your own people, you know, it's, it's improved. I think our culture has always been real good. Uh, you know, obviously now it, it screams championship culture now. Um, you know, but we, you know, I, I think, you know, architect, the, the roster architecture of game processors, guys that can pass, shoot, uh, and, and really think the game I think has, has helped, you know, significantly. Um, it's hard to change people. Um, you could outnumber them severely, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and mitigate, um, you know, some of the selfishness and, um, but the thing I think helps me a lot here and in this place and then the kind of the way that we recruit people, you know, JJ, I think we, we weed out, um, because it stores Connecticut, um, you know, because it's the Northeast, you know, you, you've spent some time here. It's crazy cold. The sun doesn't come out a lot in the winter. Right. So the weather sucks and, um, you know, and, and it's, a, and, and stores is, is not, you know, the, the, the sexiest place you can go to college, right. For lack of a better word. I mean, you, you said brutal honesty, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what, so what does it attract? It attracts serious people. No one ever picks UConn for the wrong reasons. You know, like yeah. no one's picking here because we got a 110, uh, seat football stadium or they fall in love with the weather uh, or, or those things. So serious people come here and they never pick here for the wrong reasons. Uh, viral Twitter clip that came up after you guys <clears throat> won your second straight national championship last week. I don't even know which one you're talking about. Well, there's, there was a bunch. There was a bunch. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you're very famous right now. But <laughs> um, the, I think it was against Villanova, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in January of 2020, uh, you said, you better get us now. What gave you the confidence to say that after a game? Now, three years before you won, win your first one, four, you know, it's been four years since you said that. What gave you the confidence to say it in that moment? Yeah. Um, you threw a curve. But I thought you were going to ask me. I thought you asked me at the ED. Uh, the stare down or me fighting with the fans. I mean, there's so many. Uh, well, there's also you pushing Cam Spencer. Yeah, which <laughs> first of all, I did not know the rule. And I just desperately wanted him to run the twin from the other side of the court because we, we didn't have Steph was in the wrong corner, Steph Castle. But uh, yeah, so um, what was the question? <laughs> well, no, the question. You better got, get us now. You got to get us now. So, um, I mean, part of it was, um, you know, just a, a tremendous belief. I, I, I got like incredible coaching staff, you know, JJ, who at, you know, at the time with, you know, Kamani Young and, and Luke Murray and Tom Moore, I got like the apps, like all three of these guys should be head coaches, like mid-major plus or higher, man. So like total killer staff. And then, uh, you know, just the talent level 
with where we were was not in a great place, but we had walked down so many programs from the year before. So like the year before, you know, uh, we played Villanova at MSG right before Christmas, you know, and, and Jay scrooged our ass. I mean, he beat us by 25 at MSG right before Christmas and it was humbling. Um, so now fast forward a year later, we go play them at Wells Fargo. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a one point game with 35 seconds to go and our talent and we're nowhere near where we're going to be like from a, from a talent standpoint, but we've, we've closed that gap. You know, and, and I know I had some studs on the way, you know, we, we just, um, you know, we, we knew that we were, we, we were getting really, really close. And now you're at a place like UConn with it, where you got this history, you got this tradition, you know, it's like the, the fans needed a state of the union address. Like, they, you know, they needed their president to get up there in the oval office and say something, you know, cause you know, 2014 felt like a long time ago. Um, so it was like, listen, man, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're 10 and seven, you know, you better say something because <laughs> these people are going to lose their shit. So, um, <laughs> Plus, you, I knew I, I we knew it was coming, and you know I, I wish some you know, a couple couple of very famous coaches have used it since. I wish they would have credited it to me, but we all steal, <laughs> coach, all steal, all steal from each other. Very true. We all steal. Before I let you go, uh, I you know I was going to ask you about coaching in the tournament, um, and and how that's different, right? And I lived it, and coach would break it down a certain way. But as I was trying to find that fucking Bobby Bowden quote from the beginning, I found another Bobby Bowden quote that I liked even better. He's, <laughs> and and when, we, when any team that wants to win a championship, right, when they talk about what, what kind of year do we want to have, it, it means a championship, right? And that was the expectation at Florida State. It certainly is the expectation at UConn. It was the expectation when I played at Duke. That's the type of year you want to have, a championship. So Bobby Bowden has this quote, to have the kind of year you want to have, something has to happen that you can't explain why it happened. Something has to happen that you can't coach. Do you find any truth in that over the last two years, getting all the way to the championship, winning a championship? Are there things that happen that you can't coach, that you didn't plan for, that you can't explain? Yeah. Uh, because I know you're a fucking psychotic type A person. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the only things I'm fucking thinking about right now, man, um, all the things like even, you know, Cam Spencer, man, who is like, we're looking for somebody in the portal and they got to fit us, JJ. So we literally recruit one player in the portal at the guard spot to try to replace, uh, you know, Jordan Hawkins last year. And we're not just going to bring somebody in. So, you know, we're just like, uh, you know, April turns to May, you know, May turns to June and we still haven't found our guy. And if we went into the season, you know, with, with without Cam Spencer, we're, we're, you know, we're probably a top, top 20 team that maybe has a ceiling to get to a sweet 16, maybe, a, maybe a second weekend. Um, but that kid just deciding, you know, in late May, early June, that, that he was going to then, you know, decide to leave Rutgers at a time where like the absolute perfect player for the way we play, the perfect temperament, uh, the perfect age for an absolute ready-made team. Um, like if that doesn't happen, we're not back to back. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not back to back champs. If Donovan Klingen isn't born in Bristol, Connecticut, you know, <laughs> he was born in Bristol. Okay. You've been to Bristol. I mean, he was born in Bristol, Connecticut, right there. Seven, two, if, if he's, I mean, I don't know if he's born in, you know, if he's born in Florida, you know, if he's born in New York City, man, like, right, that guy, I don't know, is he, is he going to turn down, you know, chance to play at Duke or North Carolina? Um, I mean, who knows? So there's all, all that type of shit, plus all the superstitions, you know, if I didn't have, my, if my wife didn't do my underwear, like, like this year, JJ, I mean, what, 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 what were our chances, you know? Right. No, <laughs> Totally. Crazy. Not totally. great, man. Not at all. <laughs> totally. Uh, coach, I appreciate the time. I, I know you got a lot going on. There's always uh, so a lot. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for the time. I appreciate it. And congratulations again. Uh, it's remarkable what you've built and what you guys have done. 
Uh, and uh, I know we, uh, I think we had a brief interaction on first take last year after you guys won. Uh, but just, uh, you know, obviously with the with the Bobby connection, uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. So appreciate it. And I yours, man. And I'll, uh, I'll see you at the draft, man.